Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Borida, Kroiso, Kanes. A very warm welcome to you. Delighted that you've uh, decided to join us here for our uh, uh, daily Bible study. Just 10 minutes or so looking at God's Word uh, at Kinmel Bay Church. Aware of the fact that people joining us are not just Kinmel Bay people, but they're from other places as well. We want to give you a very, very warm welcome wherever uh, you are this morning. Aware of the fact that there are some people in Spain uh, from the church that I used to be pastor of uh, who have decided to link in with us uh, on a daily basis as far as these Bible uh, studies are concerned. Uh, And there will be others from other places as uh, well. Melanie up in Scotland, she links in with us. Good morning, Melanie. It's great to see you. Boreda. Now, this morning, we're starting on a new series in the Gospel of John. You will have been told that over the last couple of days by Jarrett Darren, uh, I am sure. Uh, the last of the Gospels, and the Gospel of John, the last of the Gospels, and different in many ways from the others. The others, the first three Gospels, are collectively known sometimes as the synoptics, uh, which means that they are narrative in their approach and generally follow the same pattern. Now, John is narrative, of course he is, but for instance, there are no parables in John and there is considerably more teaching in John that accompanies uh, the narratives. Uh, For example, in John, we find the, is it seven I am statements that our Lord Jesus Christ uh, uses. Uh, You remember, he said, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. And indeed, those statements and the narratives generally, well, uh, are accompanied uh, by teaching on those subjects. There is also teaching uh, about the relationship between the three persons of the Trinity, and that's always something that we can benefit from. There is our Lord's high priestly prayer in John's Gospel in chapter 17, uh, which, which, which is remarkable, really. There's a thrilling time ahead of us, folks, a thrilling time. I'm certain of that as we look at together uh, the Gospel of John. Let's have a think for just a moment uh, about the author of this Gospel. He doesn't identify himself by name only as the disciple whom Jesus loved. There's a clue there. In fact, it's sufficient for us to work out who it is. Several factors confirm that this John was the brother of James, the two sons of Zebedee, sometimes referred to uh, as the Sons of Thunder. What a lovely title uh, to carry. Along with Simon Peter, James and John are generally accepted as being the nearest uh, of the disciples to our Lord and Saviour. They were there, you'll remember, at the Transfiguration. They were there and witnessed that. They were with the Lord Jesus in Gethsemane's garden. John, the writer, was also present at the cross and he was a witness. He was a witness to the resurrection. Okay, so we know who the author is. What was the purpose of the book? Well, I'm delighted to say that John told us what his purpose was towards the end of the gospel, but nevertheless it's there. In chapter 20 and verse 31, we read these words. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So his purpose was clearly to prove the deity of the Lord Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God, and to inspire faith in Jesus as the only way uh, to God. Now, in the time that's available to me this morning, I want to make very quickly just two points. Let's start with the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verses 1 and 2, we read these words. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You will have noticed, I'm sure, that the word Word is spelt with a capital W. A capital W. 
The reference to word is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now listen again as we take that word, word out and put our Lord's name in its place. In the beginning was the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus was with God and the Lord Jesus was God. He, the Lord Jesus, was with God in the beginning. Now, isn't that smashing? Isn't that absolutely smashing? But you see, it's smashing, but it doesn't end there. Wonderful it is. But if you look down at verse 14, you'll read these words. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Again, take the word word out, put in the name of the Lord Jesus, and the verse reads, the Lord Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we're introduced early on in his gospel account by John to the fact that whilst he was here on earth, in Jesus, we are confronted, if I can use the term, by the God man. We're confronted by the God man. We're confronted by the one who is both God and man. I've heard people say on more than one occasion uh, that whilst he was here upon the earth, uh, the Lord Jesus was half God and half man. I'm tempted to use the word rubbish, but I'm far too polite. That idea is wrong, okay? That idea is wrong. Listen to what uh, Paul had to say on the subject in the letter to the Colossians. The Colossian Christians were a group of people who had lost their way, really. They'd forgotten who the Lord Jesus Christ was and is. And Paul writes to put them right. And in chapter 1 and verse 19, he says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in the Lord Jesus. And then later on, he makes the point again when he says, For in Christ, for in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form. Charles Wesley, in his most famous carol, I would guess, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, wrote concerning the Lord Jesus, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Emmanuel, said another gospel writer, Emmanuel, God is with us. Can I shout hallelujah? I'm going to anyway. Emmanuel, God is with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we read in this chapter the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ emphasized. The fact that he is God. And that doctrine really continues to be emphasized throughout the gospel. The fact that he is God. But as well as that, well, John wastes no time whatsoever in introducing the gospel. In verse 11, well, John tells us that Jesus came to his own. That's the Jewish nation. We know that. But he also says that they didn't receive him. And we're aware of that as well. But then John goes on in verse 12 to say, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's worthy of being read a second time. To all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God. What a gospel declaration right at the beginning of what John writes. A superb gospel declaration and one that you cannot misunderstand at all. One that you cannot misunderstand at all. We as Christian people well refer to God as our Heavenly Father. We pray our Father who art in heaven. We refer to him as our Heavenly Father. Father. What does that make us? Well, on the basis of what this verse says, and we rejoice in the fact, it makes us God's children. He's our Heavenly Father. We are his children. 
How did we become his children? By believing in Jesus and receiving him into our lives. Nothing of ourselves, nothing of ourselves at all. It's all of God's grace. The message of the gospel, John emphasizes it, is something that God has done and we accept by faith. Well, that's just a very, very brief introduction to what's ahead of us for these next few weeks. But before I close the computer down, let me say this to you. Let me point my finger at you. You. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Sitting there, okay? I need to say to you, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you received him into your life? Do you know God in a personal way through faith in Jesus? That's what this Gospel of John is all about. That's the message that it declares. Can you call God your Heavenly Father? Well, it's the privilege of those. It's the privilege of those who know Jesus as Saviour. So, you, who I'm looking at, if you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus as your Saviour, let me urge you to do that. My prayer is that you do that. I believe that we're in for a great time in our studies here in John's Gospel. I guess, and I say this to close now, it would be helpful. It would be helpful uh, to uh, uh, the chaps that uh, open up God's Word week by week if you were to read the chapter that we're going to be dealing with on the day before you sit down and listen to the block. So, two things that you have to do now when I finished. You can read chapter one again, as it were, and then you can read chapter two as well. So whoever's leading tomorrow morning knows that he's addressing people who've already read the chapter that he's going to be dealing with. Let's pray. And you, are kind tired, our God and our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the way that it excites us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that it outlines uh, to us the manner by which we've become um, subjects of your grace. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. And we pray that in our studies here in John's Gospel, he might be lifted up. He might have the preeminence in everything. Yeah, we ask in his name. Amen. See you soon. Have a good day.